in the near front, Zanetta. Thank you. Hi, and my name. Hi, my name is Judd Harriet. I have a question for Larry. I'm intrigued at your, your conclusion that uh, there's no skills gap and that inequality is not about lagging education. Can I draw you out a little bit more on this? Because it flies in the face of a lot of conclusions that labor mobility, not intergenerational mobility, but labor mobility is stifled by skills deficits. Labor, labor cannot move into more dynamic sectors. Thank you. Great thing to expound, expound on, Larry. Yeah, well, well thank you. Um, yeah, this is a uh, important question. What is the role of, uh, of education and more skills? So let me say that um, uh, we can distinguish between things that promote individual mobility and things that are going to decrease inequality. So I, I, I believe that uh, getting more education and training and getting as much skills as you can is something that is really important to provide for every working class young person or even working person uh, as much as they can get and that they will do better the more education and training and skill skills that they possess and that will increase their mobility into uh, uh, better strata. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't believe that the reason why high wage workers uh, did a lot better than middle wage workers is that middle wage workers had didn't have enough skill uh, or education. Uh, and uh, did, let me just give you an, an example of that. The uh, gap between, um, the, you know, the usual story is that the, the wage gap between, let's say, college educated workers and high school educated workers, call that the college wage premium, that that grew and that pushed up wage inequality. If you look at the data we present in the book and you look at the periods uh, 79 to 95 and 95 to now, and there's no, there's no picking and choosing of dates to get the result, but it's basically dividing up the last 30 years into 15-year portions. The gap between the top and the middle grew pretty continuously and strongly. It grew not as strong in the second period as the first, but in the first period, the gap between college and high school grew a lot, in the second, hardly at all. So it's just prima facie not true that the education wage gaps could possibly have driven overall wage inequality over the last 15 years. And it's also true that if you look uh, at the wages of workers with higher education, you will find that workers with an associate degree, which we can only get back to 1992, earn no more now than they did in 1992. And that workers with a college degree that the bottom 70% of college graduates uh, earn the same or less now than 10 years ago. So what this means is that you're better off if you're a college graduate than if you're not. But the fact of getting everyone a college degree is less of a guarantee for uh, expanding the middle class, as people say, or maybe it once was. Thank you. OK, we'll go to a question in the very but back. I'd glad to follow up with this later. This is a very important uh, and complicated question. My name is Tanya Hutchins from the Machinist News Network. You mentioned empowerment and doing things a different way. How can workers um, do anything, if they can, to change the status of collective bargaining compared to past years? Uh, Our resident expert on I guess I'll collective that. bargaining uh, and unions. Uh, well, you know, there's it's going to take a lot of different things to be able to expand collective bargaining. I mean, it's going to take changes in the law. It's going to have to take changes in, uh, in, in, what, in what unions do and what workers do. We know that prior to this recession, there were uh, a, a, a very large amount of the workforce wanted to have uh, the benefits of collective bargaining, but they weren't able to and that we have a paper by Richard Freeman of Harvard. He's really the preeminent labor market economist in the world, in my view. And uh, if every worker who wanted collective bargaining got it, we would have unionization rates comparable to Germany, okay? So the question is, you know, what can make that happen? Part of it is that, I, I, you know, people are very brave to see collective bargaining. I think we need to uh, assure that everyone has that right, uh, people should seek it, they should 
call the machinists. They should call uh, like warehouse workers around the country are doing now, et cetera. Uh, but it's not something that is just about their benefit. It's part of restoring labor standards so that as employers seek to make better profits by uh, worsening job quality. What we really want is an economy where employers are competing to make better products that people want more efficiently, but not spending a lot of time thinking about how to find ways to pay their workers less or to give people more economic insecurity. Go to a question over here. Well, since you're there, it's fine. Debbie Chalfie with AARP, another group that didn't get a fact sheet. Um, but uh, I forgive you. We'll, um, <laughs> we'll given, talk about that. Yeah, given the aging of the workforce, I was wondering if um, all of you could maybe comment on one or two of the findings that struck you as you were doing this year's book. Uh, about older workers, either good or bad. You go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> One thing that really jumped out was the importance of Social Security and Medicare for older workers. I mean, it, it, at least touched on it. What, was that what you yeah, yeah, so. yeah, said? Yeah, well, you said. <laughs> but it was, it's just a, um, astounding how much of a share of their um, income and growing that that made up of over this period, and so underscores why. We need to make sure that those things are um, not cut back dramatically. I can, do you want to? These two want to talk about yeah, health care. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, in the, in the poverty chapter, I talk about the extent that Social Security has, um, the role that Social Security has played in reducing elderly poverty. We saw in the numbers that came out last week, again, it's the group that has the lowest rates of poverty, and I think we can attribute that mostly to Social Security. All right, Dante, we've got a couple questions here, so we can just uh, keep it here for these two folks. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. You haven't said anything about automation and the information revolution. I mean, I'm told that it takes a small fraction of the people it used to take to turn out a car. Now, that's making them more productive, and they're not getting the results of their increased productivity, but it also means fewer jobs, fewer Okay. So well, fewer jobs of the kind that there used to be. All right. So comment on technology's role in all of this. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, technology implemented in the workplaces increases productivity. And, uh, and in fact, there, it, it means over time, and it, and it happens differently in different sectors, right? So manufacturing productivity is greater than the service sector. Uh, and what that means is that the relative prices of manufactured goods tend to fall relative to services. You have more productivity. And we, we don't have a system, nor should we, where the wage growth in a particular sector matches its productivity. Otherwise, someone who's a barber would be making 15th century you know, wages, right? Because it takes so long to cut ahead, it's not that, uh, you know, it doesn't get that much more quickly, quick. So the, the fact is that the, the, the technology is not, that technology uh, allowing us to produce more with less is not something, in my view, that has hurt the broad working class. Uh, it is the fact that overall, on average, we haven't had the wages grow with it. So with the trend you're talking about, that's true. That means over time, the, way, the, the, the prices of cars are gonna be lowered relative to other things, which helps expand the market for cars. But it might not expand it enough to be able to maintain employment in the auto industry, which means over time, you're gonna have a shrinking share of employment in auto. And, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the problem in our society, in our economy, is that there's been such a gap between manufacturing wages and services. In other nations, there's not such inequalities across sectors. So uh, it means that if you don't get the manufacturing job, you're most likely gonna have a worse job. And a second thing is, in our economy, the very basic things that a family needs and a worker needs are tied to your employer. Whether, you, whether still somewhat, whether you get health care, whether you get a good pension, whether you get vacations, whether you get sick leave, uh, family leave, all those different things are tied to your particular employer. In other nations where that is universal, you know, which industry you work in doesn't matter that much because this is a, a right of citizenship. You're a producer. You get those benefits. 
categories of jobs that have disappeared. Like I'm, I'm, I'm an attorney. There are no typists. There are no yeah. secretaries. We all those jobs, even some lawyers' jobs now, are going overseas. Right. So jobs are disappearing. Because there are jobs disappearing, but it, in in my view, some of that is part of a phenomena which generates jobs other places, because things become cheaper to produce in those places where you have labor-saving technologies. You know, the whole issue of offshoring and imports is a is a different topic. Thing really fast. Please. If you put that on, can you put that on slide 21? I think this is a good thing, a good time. It's just a long trend of productivity. There. Is that the one? This, I think, is useful to keep in the back of your head when you hear about increasing productivity because it always increases. We always, the economy is always evolving. We're always seeing technological change. We, it's just a constant in the economy. So what, and there's, it's, it's not obvious that in recent years that's been a whole lot, that trend, that we've been off that trend very dramatically. So I think that um, is, when you, when you hear this narrative about, it's about technology, to keep that in your mind of, is it, is it different than this long term, we just always have an evolving economy, and we actually, that's the, that productivity growth is the potential for living standards growth. And so we, you know, like, in, yeah, keeping that trend in the back of our minds when we hear this stuff is probably a good idea. Sir. I'm uh, Jerry Dances, and this has been wonderful. Or Actually, things are terrible, but that you're exposing it is wonderful, so we'll say that. I don't know, is it possible to, to, I don't know, to quantify some of the, um, actually, absolute damage that is, is, is happening to people? Because you, I, I got the impression, say, if, if you look at the middle, that the, the wages have, have, have basically stayed the same. Uh, but I know that um, housing and rental costs have gone way up, and that college tuition, say, at state colleges has gone way up. So does that mean that if you took a middle person, middle family today compared to, I don't know, 30 years ago, that, that they're living in, in less quality housing and, or that um, previously they could afford to send <coughs> several children to the state university, but, but, uh, but now they can't? All, all the data trends we present are inflation adjusted, which means that we take into account uh, what BLS says is the price changes uh, in what people purchase. Now, there's going to be lots of arguments about what's included, what's not, whether it's quality adjusted and the accurate and all that stuff. Uh, so the, a lot of the things you mentioned are, are included in that. But I, I think it is uh, daunting, you know, uh, what's happened to housing prices uh, what's happened to uh, access to college, uh, et cetera. And I think those are, uh, you know, r really important things. We don't, I just want to be clear, we don't maintain that the living standards of a middle class family is less now than uh, 30 years ago. Because um, I, I don't, I think that's a fruitless uh, debate, whether it's up, down, a little, up a little. Etc. I mean, given that productivity grew 80 percent, the question is why did it not? And that every family, on, on, the families on average, are working more hours. You know, the question is why did they not do a lot better? So I just want to differentiate uh, on, on that score. Okay, we have a question over here, Kelly. Hi, uh, Kelly Ross with the AFL-CIO. On one of your early slides, you had uh, long-term projections by the Congressional Budget Office of Employment. And um, uh, um, I thought it was interesting that the employment, uh, unemployment rate settled at a, a higher level with each projection. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on what's going on there. I think what's going on there is that they are changing their um, uh, estimate of what the natural rate of unemployment is. Um, and um, I wonder if you agree with that. And if that is the case, uh, it, it, never, it never settles back at a rate that it was before the Great Recession. Oh, right. And uh, so we're never going to get back to that rate. And if part of the problem is um, the, the need to change our um, uh, policy on full employment, if we can do that, if the uh, economics profession has uh, ch uh, changed its estimate of what the natural rate of unemployment is. 
Yeah. Good question, yeah. Kelly. Well, I think there's two things going on. One is that they've been continuously wrong, is what that says. That they have been uh, optimistic as to what's going to happen uh, continuously. So they've, uh, every year, they push out when they get back, think we're going to get back to what they are considering full employment. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, they, they have raised what they consider full employment, and that's, in, in our view, uh, they're mistaken as to what we can expect uh, as full employment. They may be saying, I don't know, five and a half, six percent. Uh, you know, we know that it, it's been four, four and a half percent. Well, they may be, may, may be uh, you know, increasing that. The other thing that you can notice in those projections, which is part of all these uh, macro models, and they're just reflecting them, is, is that it, it always comes back to f what, whatever they consider full employment, they make it seem as if the economy is like automatically going to revert to that. You know, that it, it, that it gets back to that equilibrium. And, and I would challenge that, you know, the, the, the mechanisms in play are not necessarily going to restore unemployment even at that bad level. So they always have a, the model always automatically just goes down after a few years. You know, it just reverts at some level back to full employment. And that, that is wrong. So, we, you know, we, I don't actually believe there's, there's any reason why that, I, I expect that to happen. And I certainly think that a, a future policy battle is going to be defining what is the unemployment rate that's achievable and the unemployment rate with what share of the labor force working. Because also embedded in these numbers is the CBO assuming that a lot of people who left the labor force never come back. And, and we think that that's wrong. We also, another thing is, I, I don't really know that exactly why this is pushing up, but I think they have some hysteresis-y thing going on that persistent high unemployment leads to higher unemployment, um, which, you know, there's an open question here. Is it, is it a, dem but I think the bottom line here is the vast majority of the persistent high unemployment we have right now, even by these estimates, is demand. It's like even their structural rate is still far, far below where we are now. So as far as what we think of doing right now, it doesn't matter that it's crept up a little bit, though. It will matter in five years. It will matter in five years. It will be what, and, and the, when there's periods of persistent high unemployment, there's always economists coming out saying, ah, this is the new normal. Like that's what we hear after a period. In this country and around the world, that's what you hear by economists after periods of persistent high unemployment. What we have today is a demand problem. We'll okay, stop. we're going to do two more questions. Dante, this gentleman, and then Zanetta, this gentleman in the front. Thank you. I'm very retired, uh, federal service. Uh, one thing you haven't mentioned is disintegrating the American family, which has had an in, a huge impact. The median family income of two parent, uh, two, pa two parent families has been doing not so badly, uh, but there's more and more single parent family, and also the interaction. The higher the income, the more stable the family, the lower divorce rate. Okay, so family dynamics, at least you alluded to some of this, and I think in, in your part of the conversation this morning, or I could be conflating others, but just the impact of hours and changing dynamics into the labor force. So you want the first crack? Um, sure, Thanks. sure. Um, I, I think this falls into the poverty chapter, and there's actually a section um, precisely because this question comes up. So there's a section on um, what has led to increasing poverty, and what we find Primarily, it's growing income inequality. It is not factors like family formation. Um, it is not changing dynamics of um, racial composition in this country. Um, poverty has gone down because of changing composition of, of education. Um, and poverty has gone down because of growing economy. But poverty has gone up primarily because of income inequality. And it's true, when you only have one earner in a family, they're going to earn less. That's, that's a fact. You have two potential earners. They're going to earn more, and families are going to um, have potential to have higher, higher wages and higher incomes. But when we think about what is moving the poverty rate, um, at least in recent years, it has not been a change in family formation. Okay. Last question of the afternoon. Ed. From George Washington <coughs> University. Uh, there's been a lot of debate over the role of housing. Uh, in, in, in the recovery, and it's always occurred to me that it's the housing industry that seems to have the most interest in this and not so much the typical household. 
And I was wondering if you have any thoughts as to how much attention, policy attention, should be played to trying to help the housing industry as part of an effort to encourage economic recovery. The person who knows the most about this is not here, but we, I have, do you want to go ahead? Go for it. It's so one of the things is, I don't think it's the big lever that we should pull. Like we ha correct me if anyone thinks that we should, s s that anyway, correct me if I'm wrong. I, it's, not the, it's not the big lever. The key thing right now is that we have a demand problem. That we, that if we, if you, for example, got all houses who are, un who are underwater, if you just erase their debt, you have a, a sort of balanced budget multiplier problem that that debt is someone else's assets. So it's not actually going to be, and let, you have to have some pretty extreme differences in propensity to consume out of that money for it to have much stimulative effect on the economy. So given that right now the massive problem that we have is a lack of demand, um, I don't think that wouldn't be in my top list of things to solve that problem. Be a little, little more encouraging about. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't. I, I mean, I don't consider you are a housing expert, Greg. I, 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 I am not. But it, it is seen to me that we we that if you take the position that the things that is a drag on the economy is the so-called deleveraging, that is that that people uh, are uh, more in debt than they they want to be, and therefore they're consuming less, and that that's a drag on consumption growth. And that comes from the fall of housing wealth as well as stock wealth. Uh, that I mean, uh, you know, that would be a useful thing. Uh, it's one element of policy. Agreeing with you know that we could uh, do something to have the housing uh, crisis be uh, less of an albatross around the economy, and it would help us lift off uh, th that much better. And one can even get angry. You know, why is it that we bailed out? Wall Street, but we uh, uh, have left out uh, the many people that Wall Street sometimes tricked into untenable mortgages, and they're left to drown. And behaviorally, certainly people who believe that their home values are solidified and even, in fact, rising behave a lot differently than people who believe that the floor is still not yet out from under them. So that also has a deep economic impact. With that, unfortunately, we have to stop. Thank you all for coming. If you have any other questions or want to engage in chat with the authors, they're here, and they're at the uh, back of the room, so you can corner them. Feel free to do so. Otherwise, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you later.